Hi, it's John Kelly. In this module, we're going to discuss documentation. And as always, we want to be efficient and effective, follow professional standards, and document what we have done properly, which is, of course, the topic of this section. And efficiency and effectiveness is particularly important here because if we document too much, we're going to annoy staff because they're going to get bored with all the documentation and we're going to be charging our clients more than we should. So we've got to be careful that we document enough, but efficiently and effectively. Now there's something of a hierarchy in Section 230, uh, the documentation section, and it starts with an experienced auditor test. You've got to do enough documentation so that an experienced auditor can understand. And then there are some specific and some general requirements. Other sections of standards have particular specific items that must be documented. And then there are all the other requirements for the auditor to do or consider things where no documentation is formally required. Now, do we have to document it? everything? And the answer is clearly no. It is neither necessary nor practicable for the auditor to document every matter considered or professional judgment made in the audit. That's 230A7. So we don't have to document everything. And the auditor is to use judgment. The form and extent of audit documentation is a matter of professional judgment. And that's section 330. And 315 has a similar, slightly different worded requirement. The other thing is some of our documentation is implicit. So we know that we documented or we did something by the documentation in another area. And again, standards say it is unnecessary for the auditor to document separately compliance with matters for which compliance is demonstrated by documents included within the audit file. So for instance, and there are some examples in A30, A7, but one of them is the existence of an audit plan documents that the auditor planned the audit. So there are many activities that are required by standards. They say the auditor shall do something, but not all of them have to be documented. And let's think about this. For instance, we are required to do analytical procedures at the end of the audit. We are, among other things, looking for fraud and error and forming an overall conclusion. But there's no specific requirement that tells us what or how we have to document that. So is a checklist step enough? And checklist steps remind us of all the things that we shall do to help us make sure that we don't forget anything. And so the step might say, I did analytical procedures at the end of the audit. And the question is, is that enough documentation? So let's think about that. Is there a specific requirement? And the answer is no. Could the documentation be implicit elsewhere? And yes, it could, because if you've made some notes about things that that drew to your attention, or if there was nothing that it drew to your attention, that's implicit elsewhere. And we don't have to document everything, so that means we don't have to do it. And do we need, in our professional judgment, to have it documented? Maybe, maybe not. And would an experienced auditor understand? And I think they probably would, just based on the statement in the checklist that this is something that I did and nothing came to my attention. And as a matter of fact, maybe what it might be the checklist might say, I did this, and either nothing came to my attention or the matters that came to my attention were noted someplace else, and that would then document it quite nicely. So there it is there. Checklist step and a box for other matters, or state that you did it and it was consistent with your understanding. So that would satisfy the experienced auditor test. Uh, risk assessment procedures say we must do analytical procedures during planning. And again, um, is a checklist step, I did analytical procedures acceptable, or do we have to write a long memo about what we did and what we found? And again, we apply the same test. Is there a specific requirement? Well, there is a requirement to 
do this, and it's in 31532B, we do need to document the risk assessment procedures we did. Is it implicit elsewhere? Well, yes it is, because if our risk assessment uh, procedures identified a risk of material misstatement, and that's the case because we can see it identified where we're ad assessing risk of material misstatement, then we must have done the risk assessment procedures, and they are implicit elsewhere. Don't have to document everything. That would say we don't have to. And professional judgment and the experienced auditor test, maybe. Now, there's two choices here. The first is, if you say any matters I noted during my risk assessment procedures had to be documented in one place and one place only, and then hooked to assertions, then your documentation that you did the risk assessment procedures is implicit. If you identify the risks in the planning section, I think there's a really good argument that that's not GAS because GAS in 31532C says you have to link risks identified to assertions, to procedures, so that we can document what we've done properly. So identifying risks randomly throughout the file is A, not in accordance with standards, and B, probably a really bad idea because we might then not do work to deal with that risk. Now, there is an overall documentation requirement in 238, documentation sufficient for an experienced auditor to understand the nature, timing, and extent of procedures, and presumably that's documented in an audit program, the results of the procedures and evidence obtained, and that's also probably in or reference to an audit program, and significant matters and conclusions and that's probably best in a single place in the file rather than randomly spread throughout the file because if you're documenting significant matters in random places throughout the file, it'll be very difficult for the partner or the reviewer to find them and understand them and come to conclusions about them. Another specific requirement, we are to record identifying characteristics. And that should be automatic as we select items. I want to look at five invoices. Um, I've picked invoice number one, seven, and nine. Well, I've identified the, or documented the identifying characteristics. Who did the work and when? That's in the working paper, presumably. And who reviewed the work and when? And let's go to the next slide for that. Standards say the requirement to document who reviewed the work performed does not imply a need for each specific working paper to include evidence of review. So here's what a summary page might look like. We'd have cash and bank and investments and so on down all the different components that were audited in an index. And then having a column for reference to significant matters, either none or reference to a working paper, that means that the reviewer and the partner have a single page to look at to find if there are any issues in the audit. And that's a very convenient and efficient way of doing things. Also, we can have boxes here for the reviewer to initial and date, and even for the preparer to initial and date. So this is a really efficient and effective way of showing whether or not a section has been reviewed, whether or not a section has been prepared, and documenting the date. There is a requirement in 230 to assemble the file, that we are to assemble an audit file, and A21 tells us that that is to be done ordinarily within 60 days of the report date. And the word ordinarily means that sometimes it could take longer. After assembly, nothing may be deleted from the file. So audit report date, 40 days later, we have the file assembled and we document that assembly date. After that date, nothing may be deleted from the file. However, after assembly, anything can be added. All you have to do is note the reason it was added, date it, and say who did it. Now, this is sometimes referred to as lockdown, and that's really not correct because you can always add things. The thing that's important to document is the date you completed the file, and you need that to document compliance with 230.14. And then after that, you just don't delete anything. 
Now there are other shall document requirements and they're all listed in the appendix to 230 and we're going to go through those quickly because they're going to be discussed in other sections. So the engagement letter must be in writing and include certain matters and there are certain things that happen if laws override sections in the engagement letter. Quality control, ethical requirements, independence, acceptance and continuance, consultation. And if needed, you have to document an engagement quality control review. Fraud and illegal acts. You have to document decisions about fraud risk and risk of material misstatement and that duplicates the same requirement in Section 315. So the two are kind of the same. Your response is also the same as 315. If you found fraud, if needed, then you would communicate with those charged with governance. And there is a requirement in the fraud section. If you conclude that there's no risk of material misstatement in revenue recognition, you have to say why you concluded that. And a legal act you would document if found. Communication of those charged with governance. There's some things you have to and other things if uh, appropriate or if required you communicate. Planning, you have to document your plan, your strategy, plan, and changes. 315, probably the most important section, a close tie with 330. You must document your decisions and discussions about risk of material misstatement, key elements of that discussion and that investigation, and you have to document risk of material misstatement overall at the financial statement level and by assertion, and whether or not you think any of those risks are significant risks. That's a really important section. Materiality, you document overall materiality, specific performance materiality, and performance materiality. Response to risk, another most important section. You document your overall response and your response to risk of material misstatement by assertion. You have to document the linkage of the procedures you performed to your assessment of risk of material misstatement, the results of your procedures and conclusions if needed. If you have used prior evidence, you document your conclusions about that, and you document that the financial statements agree to the records of the client. Misstatements document the level of trivial misstatements, accumulate misstatements and whether corrected and a conclusion, estimates a conclusion, and indicators of bias, if any. Related parties, names, group audits, if it is, there's things to document, internal audit, if there is one and you use it, there's things to document. So other matters you would document as needed and you would use judgment and you would remember that. 230A7 tells us we don't have to document everything. Our focus should be on doing a good audit, and we should hope that good documentation flows from doing a good audit. I quote Manson Cooley, who said, documents create a paper reality we call proof. And it's really important that we don't get so focused on documentation that we're making that the most important thing we do in the audit, and we're forgetting to do a good audit. We've got to make sure you're doing a good audit and hope that the documentation flows from that. So thanks for listening.